You are too late. My blood now flows through her veins. She will live through the centuries to come as I have lived. Hello humans, welcome to The Grey and Everything, the world's only podcast about art, donuts and transformation. I'm Patrick, a former banking lawyer who saw the light and quit to dedicate my life to culture and philosophy, and also sitting on the couch watching old horror movies. Speaking of old horror movies, today I want to speak about old horror movies, and also other things, because today we tackle one of the most interesting and enduring products of our Western culture, Dracula, the Prince of Darkness. Have you ever wondered why we're so attracted to bad guys, and villains and anti-heroes? I mean, we're endlessly fascinated by stories about outlaws. And I don't just mean ethical outlaws like Robin Hood, you know, stealing from the rich, giving to the poor, that kind of thing. No, I mean flat-out criminals like Jesse James and John Dillinger and through to Al Capone and Pablo Escobar. We love stories about gangsters. And think about it, The Godfather is one of the most beloved movies of all time. Then, of course, you have the modern classic Scarface, Although I don't think I can really refer to it as a modern classic anymore. Jesus, it's been almost 40 years. Bloody hell, I'm old. More recently, we have actual modern classics. Tony Soprano from The Sopranos. We have uh, Breaking Bad's Walter White. And these guys, they're not just anti-heroes. They're actual villains. They just happen to be villains in stories where we like their enemies even less. And why are we so captivated by these bad people? I guess, first of all... Just like with our actual heroes, with anti-heroes, there's an element of wish fulfillment. We want to be them because these are characters that take control of their lives. They don't surrender to their environment, they shape it. And that's what Superman has in common with Pablo Escobar. They both exercise power, they both fight back. Superman fights back against injustice, Pablo Escobar fights back against the government. But still, power fantasy doesn't cover everything. I mean, even a rapist exercises power over his victims, right? Or a wife beater, or Hitler, they all exert power over someone. But we don't identify with them. So there's got to be something more going on here than just the desire for raw power. I mean, what is it that makes us identify with an anti-hero and not with Jack the Ripper? I think the thing is that at the end of the day, we don't really want to see ourselves as the bad guys. And so, even with anti-heroes, there needs to be some kind of redeeming quality. Or maybe just redeeming about the way these anti-heroes are portrayed. Maybe it's just a tragic backstory that humanizes the anti-hero, or it's a motivation that we can get behind, you know, like with Black Panther's Killmonger. He's an asshole, but we sympathize with him because his motives are something that we can get behind. And then you have these outlaws like Jesse James and John Dillinger. They're criminals, but they're commonly depicted as upright, as honorable people. So we can get behind that. And then you've got a character like Dexter, right? He's a serial killer, literally one of the worst things you can be. But he has a code. He only kills villains. So there's a redeeming feature there. But there's another aspect here. All of these outlaws, these gangsters, these sympathetic serial killers, they're all up against an adversary that's far more powerful than them and that has far more resources than they have, the government. It's a David and Goliath situation. Our sympathetic outlaws, they've got that underdog shine and we love underdogs. So what we have with these charismatic villains is a power fantasy and some kind of redeeming feature that makes them somewhat relatable. But the character I want to talk about today defies this categorization because he's hugely popular. We're talking one of pop culture's greatest icons. He's got more books, more movies, and more shows written about him than pretty much any other character in human history. Yet despite his popularity, this character isn't an anti-hero. He's a straight-up villain, completely corrupt, no redeeming features whatsoever. You could say he's almost synonymous with pure evil. And he's not an underdog either. Not only is he way more powerful than his enemies, he's also more powerful than the laws of nature itself. I'm talking about Count Dracula. 
Now take a minute to think about how weird Dracula's enduring popularity is. There really is no one else like him. And we're talking about a villainous monster entirely devoted to the destruction of innocent life. Yet he's a major object of fascination and even desire. Because unlike, say, Jack the Ripper, we kind of want to be Dracula, and we definitely want to shag Dracula. And it wasn't always like this. See, Dracula didn't start off as a sexy villain. Originally, he was a monster. But among Dracula's many powers, he's also a shapeshifter. And just like he can morph into a bat or a wolf or a mist, his character also has a unique ability to evolve to reflect the social and moral concerns of the time. So since he first appeared in Bram Stoker's novel in 1897, Dracula's transformed so many times, taken on so many new qualities and new powers and new motivations. Every different version has influenced the ones that came after. And the trend, the direction of this evolution has been pretty clear. Dracula's gone from monster to sex symbol. But before I take a closer look at that transformation, I just want to say a few words about why I'm talking about Dracula today. When we're talking Dracula, we're talking real pop culture A-list, you know, triple A-list. I mean, who's as big as Dracula, really? Whose name is as recognizable in any country, from child to grandmother? You can ask anyone and they know who you're talking about. I mean, you can count characters like that on one hand. You've got Superman, you've got Batman, you've got James Bond, maybe Sherlock Holmes, and then you've got Dracula. And yeah, there's a bunch of other biggies. Some of them, they're not quite as popular as they used to be, like Tarzan or Zorro or Frankenstein. You've got some of the classic Disney and the Looney Tunes characters, you know, with Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny. Or you've got characters that are that big, but they just haven't endured as long, you know, like Darth Vader or Homer Simpson. And you know, I'm always interested in that. I'm interested in pop culture icons because, well, I guess the key word here is culture. These characters are products of our culture. So they speak to the desires and the ambitions and the fears of the societies that produce them. They tell us something about ourselves. And the characters like Dracula that have been successful for so long, I mean, we're now in his third century. These characters, they possess some Universal characteristic, I guess, that transcends their original time. So while they can keep adapting to represent changing societal issues, they also tell us something about ourselves that remains the same, that remains true over time. So what I'm saying is pop culture characters, the really important ones, they matter. The same way that Achilles and Odysseus and Hamlet matter. Maybe more. So who was the original Dracula? I mean, Count Dracula, the vampire. You know, people in my life who know I do a podcast, they, they always ask me what I've been thinking about, what I'm reading, etc. And for the past couple of weeks, I've just said Dracula. And they all, and I mean all without exception, assume that I'm talking about Vlad Tepes III, Vlad the Impaler, the historical character that supposedly inspired Count Dracula. But that's not it. You see, Vlad the Impaler is not actually Dracula. He just became associated with Dracula because Bram Stoker evidently liked the name of Vlad the Impaler and also Vlad the Impaler's father, Vlad the Dragon, Vlad Dracula. But it's likely that all Stoker really knew about the character was the name and little else. So we're talking about Dracula the character, the vampire. Let's just summarize the broad strokes of the story because the plot of the book gets changed in the various movies and shows over the time, but the big elements, they kind of say the same. So you have an Englishman who travels to Transylvania. And this Englishman is usually, but not always, called Jonathan Harker. And he's a young lawyer who's been summoned to assist Count Dracula with the purchase of real estate in England. Now, the book itself opens with Harker's description of Transylvania in his diary. And man, what a place Transylvania is. I once spent three weeks there with my friends Brian and Tim, and we traveled to ancient ruins hidden in mountain forests, and we actually visited the birthplace of the historical Vlad Dracula, and we also went to some of the castles that inspired the legend, and I gotta say, it's easy to see why Bran Stoker would have been so inspired by it. Transylvania is an ancient, wild place. It's largely untouched by civilization, and when you're driving through those dark, beautiful forests, 
constantly cloaked in mist and thunder. The feeling you get is just undeniable. It's like Transylvania itself is alive, and its mountains are seething with an unsettling primal energy. And Stoker must have felt that too, and through Harker's diary, he describes it perfectly. So in the book, and in most movie versions, Harker eventually makes it to Castle Dracula. And once there, he gradually becomes aware of something weird going on. This Dracula guy, he's not your ordinary nobleman. And he also notices that, far from being an esteemed guest in the castle, he's actually Dracula's prisoner. So Dracula ends up leaving Harker there in the castle to be devoured by his vampire brides. And he himself departs for England. And once he arrives, Dracula begins to prey on the locals. But soon, a group of men and women begin to piece together what's happening with all these bizarre and unsettling deaths, and they form a coalition to fight back against this great evil. The main characters in this group are Jonathan Harker himself, who's managed to escape Dracula's castle and make it back to England, his wife, Mina Harker, who's probably the best character in the book, and notably Abraham van Helsing, a Dutch doctor and scientist who's got an interest in the occult, and he's the guy whose job it is to deliver information about what vampires are and how to defeat them. So the team chases Dracula back to Transylvania, and they eventually kill him. That's broadly the story. Now, as a character, the original Count Dracula from the book is, well, he's a monster. Physically, he looks bizarre and hideously ugly. Here's a description from Jonathan Harker's diary. Dracula had a long white moustache and was clad in black from head to foot without a single speck of colour about him anywhere. His face was aquiline with a high bridge of the thin nose and peculiarly arched nostrils with lofty domed forehead and hair growing scantily around the temples but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy moustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking, with peculiarly sharp white teeth that protruded over the lips. His ears were pale and at the tops extremely pointed. The general effect was one of extraordinary pallor. And then there's a bunch of other beastly characteristics like short squat fingers but with long claw-like nails cut to a sharp point. And then there's this one gross detail that his palms are hairy, which doesn't mean what you think it means, you pervert. So if you're thinking of Dracula as the sexy vampire we now associate the character with, well, that guy's not going to be around for a while yet. This original Dracula is just gross. And it's not just his appearance either. Harker says that, as he touched me, I could not repress a shudder. His breath was rank. A horrible feeling of nausea came over me. So you see, Dracula is generally repulsive. And later, when Harker goes to the crypt in that classic scene where he finds Dracula asleep in his coffin, with fresh blood on his lips, the Count is described as disgustingly bloated and gouged with blood like a filthy leech. Now, this horrible grossness, this monstrosity, it fits with the time the story is being told. This is Victorian Britain with its strong focus on social order and moral purity, and of course, the dominant colonial ethos. Britain, at this time, is the largest empire in the world, right? It oversees countless foreign peoples. And these people, they're seen as less civilized, so they need to be dominated, so that order can be imposed upon the chaos that these subject people would naturally revert to if they were left to their own nature. So here we have a foreigner, Dracula, described as clearly subhuman in appearance, and malicious in intent, of course, who invades England from abroad and threatens both the social and the moral order, but also the natural order of things. I mean, God's own laws, if you will, because he has these powers, like, you know, his bite brings people back from the death. It's supernatural. It's unnatural. And of course, because Dracula is the other, other than British, other than civilized, other than alive even, He's purely evil. There's no room for nuance or shades of grey here. This is a very Victorian outlook. Now that's the book. Dracula's earliest surviving movie appearance is in Walter Murnau's Nosferatu, A Symphony of Horror. This is a German silent film from 1922, and it's considered an absolute masterpiece of expressionist cinema, you know, one of the greatest movies ever made. 
It was groundbreaking for cinematography alone, for moods and atmospheres, and it introduced a bunch of cinema techniques that, well, movies still use today, like the montage. I think the first ever montage was in Nosferatu. And in horror terms specifically, it gave us so many of the classic images that we associate with the genre and with vampires. So you have doors opening by themselves, you have the classic coffin scene, you know, with the coffin slowly opening and the hand creeping out the gap, like in the graveyard scene from Michael Jackson's video Thriller. And also other classic images, like uh, the one where the guy opens a coffin with his hatchet and rats tumble out. Or when the vampire rises straight up out of the coffin, all stiff and eerie. These are all horror cliches, but from before they became cliches. As the film critic Roger Ebert described it, to watch Nosferatu is to see the vampire movie before it had really seen itself. Now, Nosferatu is based on Bram Stoker's book, and it follows a broadly similar plot. But the filmmakers never actually got the rights to the book, so what they had to do is change all the names. So even Dracula is not called Dracula, he's called Count Orlok. And Orlok just looks really, really weird. Tall and gaunt, he's dressed entirely in black, and he has a curiously rat-like appearance, kind of disgusting, with a large, bald, skull-like head, and he's got wisps of hairs around, pointy ears. He's got these big bug eyes that never really change expression throughout the film. And he's got a hooked nose, pointy front teeth, just like a rodent, and long, pointy claws. Basically, he's a giant, disgusting rat. So we're still within the realm of the book, you know, Dracula as monster. And this disgust element may have something to do with the time the movie's filmed. I mean, this is 1920s Germany, right? With all that rising anti-Semitism. And just look at the character Orlok. We can't beat around the bush. He looks like a Jew. Just like one of those Nazi caricatures of a Jew. The pointy nose, the hunched over, greedy, claspy, claw-like fingers. And of course, you know, he's a count, so he's very wealthy. And he insinuates himself within society under false pretenses. And he wreaks havoc from within. You know, just like the Germans said the Jews did. Plus, the movie Nosferatu has this running theme of Orlok, Dracula, as a plague or a pestilence. You know, he arrives in the village and people just start dying. The film is filled with allusions to disease and rats, and of course, you know, he looks like a rat. And more importantly, we're familiar with the whole anti-Semitic trope that Jews are like rats. And of course, with the history of Jews being used as scapegoats for all manner of pestilences in the past. So in Nosferatu, we have an ugly, revolting, rat-like, Jew-looking Dracula leeching on society from within, just as fascism is rising throughout Europe. See, Dracula is already adapting He's still a monster, just like in the book. He's still the other, but now he's no longer a Victorian version, but a 1920s German version of the other. But not for long. In Hollywood's 1931 movie, Todd Browning's Dracula, starring the Hungarian actor Béla Lugosi, or as you guys probably call him, Béla Lugosi, we finally get closer to our modern conception of Dracula, and maybe the first truly classic version so this is the Dracula with the black cape and the arched eyebrows and the dark, slicked hair. The one that gets parodied in Sesame Street, etc. Bela Lugosi's Dracula is quite different from the previous versions. Because he's first and foremost a count. An elegant and suave European aristocrat. This Dracula is well-spoken, he's sophisticated and polite. And unlike the reclusive antisocial creep in Nosferatu... This Count Dracula knows how to move in high society. But of course he can. Think about it. I mean, Count Orlok's appearance is that of an inhuman monster, a beast, a rodent. How's he supposed to move in respectable circles? Lugosi's Dracula, on the other hand, looks entirely human. He doesn't even have fangs. More than that, this Dracula is attractive. Lugosi's Dracula is tall, he's well-dressed, he's got these strong, defined features, and there's this strange, alluring quality to him. Bela Lugosi himself, as an actor, is incredibly hypnotic, and his screen presence is just mesmerizing. You can't take your eyes off him. And the director knew this, so the film is littered with close-ups of Lugosi, just staring, his eyes alight with magnetism. 
It's not a bad physical trait for a character that's meant to be able to mind control his victims. And, you know, Lugoshi really sells that. And that star quality actually feeds into the character of Dracula. Because as soon as he appears in society in the movie, the ladies are immediately attracted to this charismatic foreign nobleman. And that foreignness is very important. Because we may have moved away from Dracula the monster, Dracula the creep, and started moving towards the age of Dracula the alluring villain. But this Dracula is still the other. And Lukosi's strong accent and his slow, deliberate speech is a huge part of that. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. What music they make. I love his accent because it's so obviously Hungarian and I'm part Hungarian and I speak the language. So whenever I hear Bela Lugosi, it's like I'm listening to my uncle in Budapest. But compared to the other characters in the movie with their American accents, Lugosi's speak gives Dracula this strange otherworldly feel and it highlights the fact that he's an intruder in society, just like the book version in Count Orlok. But this intruder has been invited in this intruder looks human. And, I don't know, maybe that's scarier. A Dracula that isn't confined to hiding in the shadows because of how repulsive he looks, but one that can just kind of blend in and move among us unnoticed to wreak havoc. Now, the movie Dracula itself isn't as good as Nosferatu. And, boy, it's incredibly campy. But it's definitely worth watching for two reasons. The first is it introduces so many great things that have remained canon, not just for Dracula, but for horror generally. You know, the use of fog and mist coming out of coffins and huge spider webs. Basically, all the kinds of things that you decorate your house with on Halloween, they first pop up in the 1931 version of Dracula. But the main reason is Bela Lugosi's absolutely fantastic portrayal of Dracula. This is where we see the beginnings of Dracula as we know him, the suave, hypnotic, romantic villain. Before we move on, there's also a cool bit of trivia tied to this film. Did you know that there's an almost identical Spanish version of the 1931 Dracula? Same sets, same costumes, same script, almost shot for shot the same, but with Hispanic actors and in Spanish. And the consensus is that the Spanish Dracula is far better than the Bela Lugosi version. See, in 1931, we just moved away from silent films, and these films, like Dracula, were the first so-called talkies. This created difficulties with foreign distribution, because of course with silent movies, you can just play the original movies abroad as they were shot, and you just replace the occasional speech cards that pop up with foreign language versions. Of course, talkies, they don't have speech cards, but at this point in history, dubbing and voiceovers, they're just not well established. So what production companies would sometimes do was shoot a separate foreign language version of the same film, but for distribution in Latin American markets. So they'd use the same sets, the same costumes, the same everything, but shoot at night. And so voila, Spanish version Dracula. Soy Dracula. Fast forward to 1958 with Hammer Studios version of Dracula, played by the English actor Christopher Lee. You know Christopher Lee, he played Saruman in the Lord of the Rings trilogy and Count Dooku in the Star Wars prequels. The Hammer Studios movie and the character Dracula are both big steps forward in terms of Dracula lore. Here we first start to get a Dracula that is recognisably horror by our own modern standards. I mean, by our standards, the first two movies that I discussed, they're not very scary. But here you've got all modern techniques to scare audiences. There's jump scares. A character will look around and suddenly you get a big blare of the trumpets and Dracula standing there. And of course there's violence and there's blood, there's gore. You know, horror. And Lee's Dracula as a character is a step in two different and even opposite directions. On the one hand, we're moving further down the aristocratic spectrum. This Dracula is introduced as detached and aloof and lordlike. He moves and speaks briskly and to the point. He's got this posh accent. And the vibe he gives off is a bit like an officer in the British Navy. Mr. Harker, I'm glad that you've arrived safely. I am Dracula and I welcome you to my house. But it turns out that all this civility is just a pretense. Because as soon as the thirst comes, Dracula undergoes a huge transformation. That veneer of civility evaporates and is replaced with a wild animal with red bloodshot eyes and blood dripping from bared fangs and chin. So we're back to the monster Dracula. 
So much so that Chris Lee is barely given any dialogue in these films. If it, actually in one of the films, because Chris Lee played Dracula about ten times, he doesn't actually have a single line of dialogue. It's all just animal snarls and hisses and blood-soaked fangs. Christopher Lee, he's got an incredible physicality that really sells this aspect of Dracula as a wild animal. His transformation barely involves any makeup. I mean, yeah, he's got these red contact lenses and, you know, blood, of course, but it's all just in the way the actor moves around the set and his expressions as this feral, bloodthirsty Dracula. Yet at the same time, although we've gone back to the monster, there's something primal and, I'd almost say erotic, about Lee's Dracula. His bite is almost like a kiss. It's shot as a sexual act of penetration. He's kind of like a creepy rapist, but it's undeniable that we're meant to find this hot. And it's no coincidence that the women in these Hammer Studios horrors, they're all big-breasted bombshells, and they're all, well, they let themselves be bitten by Dracula in a way that feels like they are surrendering to his charm. We've entered the world of sexy Dracula, and his victims, they find him irresistible. When his first victim, Lucy, gets bit, she starts acting like a junkie, screaming with hysterics at the garlic that the doctors put around her, you know, that make it impossible for Dracula to enter the room and bite her again. But she's hooked on Dracula now, and she wants the garlic gone. I wonder if this is a reflection of 1958, with the rise of heroin and psychedelic drugs and the incoming sexual revolution. In fact, Dracula's murder spree in this film is portrayed as a contagion, a bit like an STD, and it needs to be eradicated. At the centre of this contagion, you have the finely fanged Dracula, silent, powerful, dangerous and erotic. Next, a little pit stop with a lesser known Dracula movie, but the one that is easily my favorite. As a film, I just think it's the best Dracula movie other than Nosferatu, but you know, less dated of course, because it's not a silent movie. This is the 1979 movie by John Batham, starring Frank Langella. With this movie, we reach a real milestone in Dracula portrayals. Because, well, just hear the title. The film is called Dracula, A Love Story. So it's still the same classic Dracula story. You still have Jonathan Harker and Mina and Lucy and Van Helsing. But this time, Dracula isn't really the antagonist. Sure, he's evil, of course. He's still going around biting innocent women. But by the end of the movie, you're rooting for him and Mina. In this movie, Mina is actually called Lucy. They sometimes switch the characters around. But you're rooting for him and Mina to stay together. Because in this movie, Dracula is finally allowed to fully embrace his romantic side. Frank Langella's Dracula is dangerous, is powerful, and is amoral. He takes whatever he wants. And he's also monstrous. He has all these cool and beastly transformations into bats and wolves. And in one scene, he kind of rips off the head of one of his victims or twists it in a horrific way. But this Dracula is also charming. And crucially, he's incredibly passionate. And his dark eyes are constantly dancing around with smoldering energy. In this movie, what bonds him to Mina isn't just bloodlust. It's true love. It's a love destined to be eternal. And sure, this love comes by way of vampire bite and blood, but it's no less powerful and real. And that first bite between him and Mina isn't shot as a scene in a horror movie with all the blood like in a Christopher Lee version, but it's shot like a classic movie love scene. But the night... Was made to enjoy. Yes. Yes, it was. It was made to enjoy life and love. Look at me. Look. So we're talking Dracula by way of Phantom of the Opera. Dracula is still the other, he's still rejected by society, but now this otherness is about how misunderstood he is, how much he's a victim of societal prejudice, how he's longing for a forbidden love. The transformation of Dracula from monster to romantic is complete. The last Dracula we need to talk about is Francis Ford Coppola's 1992 version, where Dracula is played by Gary Oldman. And I think this version is probably the most popular version of Dracula because you know it's relatively recent and it's got a really high production value and people seem to like that and they don't like old stuff. But I have to confess, I really don't like this movie. In many ways, I think it's the worst Dracula 
And sure, yes, it does have high production values and it does look good. But at the same time, I think that despite it being so recent, it's really dated. I don't know if you're with me on this, but I just think that the early 90s have a really ugly aesthetic style. It's kind of over the top and you see, it has these campy elements, this lack of self-awareness. But it doesn't have the same innocence and charm of, uh, you know, the camp that you get in the 80s and the 70s and the 60s and so on. So I I just don't like the early 90s. (laughs) They look like shit. But additionally, yes, it does look good, but it's a very superficial rendition of the story. It's all style and no substance. All it does is just jump from one cool image to another cool image with no real thematic depth. I mean, I will say it's worth watching mainly for Keanu Reeves' hilariously bad English accent as Jonathan Harker. I'll attend to the Count. Thank you for your confidence. If I may inquire, what in fact happened to Mr. Renfield in Transylvania? But that's just me being mean. Really, the main reason to watch it is that it kind of completes Dracula's journey from monster to sex symbol. But at the same time, it keeps elements from all the previous versions of Dracula too. So it's kind of like Dracula throughout the ages, remixed. The first thing 1992 Dracula does is it introduces the historical Dracula. This is the first time you get Dracula's origin story and the first time the connection with Vlad the Impaler is made explicit. The movie actually opens with Gary Oldman playing Vlad the Impaler as a warrior in the Crusades and he's fighting the Turks. While back home in Transylvania, his wife, who's played by Winona Ryder, is just waiting for him to return. But although Vlad wins the battle, the Turks play a final dirty trick on him and they send her a letter telling her that her lover Vlad has been killed in battle. So Winona Ryder is understandably besides herself with grief. She's heartbroken, so she throws herself off the castle's parapet. Just another example of a premature suicide in fiction. When will these people learn? But anyway, Vlad comes back to Castle Dracula victorious after battle and finds his wife dead. And get this, the Christian priest tells him, well, you know, she was a suicide, so she's going to hell now. And Vlad is understandably peeved. He's saying, well, this is the thanks I get from God after defending his religion from the heathens. I curse your God. I renounce God and all that. And voila, Dracula the vampire is born for some reason. But who is this Dracula? Well, he's definitely returned to the Nosferatu-style horrible monster. You know, he's based on the book, so the first time he appears in the castle, he's got this pasty white face that's kind of unnatural, he's got sharp filed teeth and long claws, just like Nosferatu's Orlok, and yes, he's got hairy palms, just like in the book. Finally, a movie version of a hairy palm Dracula. So, you see, we're back to the gross, ugly Dracula of his origins. But at the same time, we also get the Bela Lugosi-style foreign aristocrat, Because later in the movie, Dracula transforms into a younger version of himself so he can seduce Mina, who again is played by Winona Ryder because she's meant to be a uh, reincarnation of Vlad's dead wife. And here, when he's younger, Dracula is an elegant, classy, mysterious, slightly weird aristocrat. You know, he's wearing sunglasses in London, for fuck's sake. And yes, he's sporting the silly Hungarian accent. Permit me to introduce myself. I... I am Fritz Vlad of Sekind. Plus, we also get elements of the Christopher Lee feral animal version. You know, this Dracula does a lot of hissing and snarling, but because now the special effects are so much better, he spends a sizable chunk of the movie as a hideous giant bat creature, and one time he becomes a weird werewolf who fucks a lady on a tombstone. This movie is packed with bestiality. And speaking of bestiality, the sex angle here is turned up to 11. This Dracula is raunchy as hell, literally. I mean, you got everything. You got tits hanging out, you got porno vampire brides, Dracula's victims sound like they're having orgasms. It's all slightly lurid, you know, it feels like one of those early 90s erotic thrillers like Showgirls or Basic Instinct. Basically, it's a very smutty movie. Dracula the Sex Pest. But it's not just sex, it's also romance, because with Gary Oldman's Dracula, you get a bucket load of that Frank Langella romantic hero in love. I know you. I have crossed oceans of time to find you. See, Gary Oldman, he falls in love with Mina because she's the reincarnation of his dead wife. And that love is sincere. At one point, he actually refuses to turn her into a vampire because he doesn't want to condemn her with his same curse. 
But then, you know, she starts giving him a weird blood blowjob on the chest, so she turns anyway. <laughs> Did I mention this movie is basically high-budget erotica? But, you know, okay, fine. I'm being hard on the movie, but actually this element of the Dracula really works. This is a Dracula with real motivations beyond just evil bloodlust. He's a man in search of lost love. So with Coppola, you can say that we've reached peak Dracula, a monstrous, bloodthirsty, but love-struck hero who likes to dress well and then turns into a wolf and fucks people. But it's also the final step in that evolution of the character, from his monstrous origins as unambiguously evil, to his current status as a romantic character with this decidedly erotic vibe. So that's Dracula, but what about vampires more generally? Well, vampires, well, vampires have always had that erotic element to them. I mean, think of the 1960s trope of the lesbian vampire movie, comic strips like Vampirella. But they've also been punks and bad boys, like in The Lost Boys, and they've been badasses like Blade. But they've rarely been purely evil. They've mostly been somehow cool and sexy and alluring kind of tempting us to, to give in to our own instincts and join them on the dark side of life. And more recently, it's fair to say that vampires have fallen square into that sexy vampire category. Think about the vampires in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You've got the evil vampires, but the main vampire characters there are Angel and Spike, basically two romantic leads, teenage heartthrobs. On the same end of the spectrum, you have True Blood and Twilight, which are just packed with, you know, sexy vampires with chiseled abs. And then you have what is perhaps the biggest milestone in the sexy vampire tradition, Interview with the Vampire. In the movie, you know, which is based on Anne Rice's original book, the vampire's bite signifies pure sensuality. You know, if you want to know just how sexy we're meant to find all this, just consider who's playing the vampires in this movie. Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Antonio Banderas. I rest my case. Today I'd say that this Anne Rice version of the vampire is pretty much the status quo. These vampires are, yes, yeah, sexy, of course, but they're also sad, depressed, they're romantic, and they're existential. They're sort of grappling with big questions like their own mortality and sexuality. So that's what you get in Jim Jarmusch's recent film, Only Lovers Left Alive, with Tom Hiddleston and uh, Tilda Swinton, with the central couple basically spending the whole movie pondering the burden of their own immortality without any meaning left in life. And more superficially, it's also the same kind of mopiness you get in the teeny vampire stuff, like Twilight. It's interesting because these are all vampires that we're clearly meant to identify with. They're relatable. They are still the other, but it's just a key. It's a way for us to explore our own otherness. You know, otherness like our own LGBT issues, perhaps, like in True Blood, or puberty, like in Buffy and Twilight, or just merely being rejected and different from society in some way. But why is it that we identify with vampires so specifically? Is it the same kind of wish fulfillment that we get with characters like Michael Corleone or Dexter? Is it perhaps that deep down, underneath our veneer of civility, there's a monster in each of us? And that maybe that's okay? Is that what this is saying? That it's okay to have a monster? It's okay to let the monster out every now and again? To just let the world know that you're not someone to be trifled with? You're not just going to take it? You can bite? Or is the fact that we relate to vampires at all a sign of a moral failing in our society? I don't know. But the fact is that after over 50 films, we keep getting stories about Dracula and we just keep lapping them up. Because throughout the decades, all these different artists and authors have continued to pour in new cultural influences into the character, new lifeblood, you can say, keeping Dracula and vampires young, fresh, and constantly evolving. So if vampires have something to say about the concerns of our time, what would a new Dracula story look like today? I'd imagine Dracula as a completely amoral being, not a monster, at least not in appearance, not like Count Orlok, because Dracula is the monster in each of us, and so it has to be invisible to the naked eye. And I'd see him as someone who exerts his influence to bend the will of entire nations, but not just through his hypnotic powers, but rather through mere propaganda and spin, through an intelligent use of social media and the news. And he'd be upfront about what he was doing, unapologetic, not hiding who he was and what he was doing. Because, of course, in the age of limitless information and reach, 
he'd be bound to find enough people to support what he was up to. Imagine that, the world divided into pro and anti-vampire camps. You'd have those terrified of the rise of a new threat to civilization, and those who choose to ignore the threat, or even gleefully embrace it and ride the wave towards annihilation. What could their motivations be? Dracula the Authoritarian. Sucking the energy out of nations, out of entire cultures, to feed his ego, his power, and youth. Not so hard to imagine, is it? The question, I guess, is, in this version, who could the Van Helsing be to drive a stake through his heart? For one who has not lived even a single lifetime, you are a wise man, Van Helsing. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Great Everything. And if you like the show, there's a few ways you can help out. You can leave a review on iTunes or anywhere else you listen to this podcast. Or you could just add me on the various Twitters and Instagrams out there. Or you can look up The Great Everything on Facebook. I have a discussion group there where people talk about literally everything. I hope I see you again here, there, or anywhere else, frankly. Until then, grazie e arrivederci. Well, arrivederci Luigi. The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app, free for iOS and Android. 